good evening all today's uh, meeting is special uh, because we are dealing with a very special topic of uh, pfic it's uh, quite rare but uh, uh, for the person who is having it it's a real issue because the end stage uh, liver disease may be inevitable so i congratulate the department of pediatrics sat tiruvannadapuram and the unit of gastroenterology sat hospital tiruvannadapuram for uh, arranging this meeting and also for linking uh, iap along with this uh, program and uh, i also uh, specially congratulate dr prashant for uh, liaison with uh, pfic advocacy and uh, resource network the the charitable organization uh, dealing with this sort of patients with a global presence and it is uh, although it is very rare uh, it's very important that uh, the patient uh, connect between themselves then only they'll know what is the uh, trouble to be expected and what are the what are the ways to um, live with it so uh, uh, pfic being a rare disease actually need an awareness uh, uh, program and hence uh, uh, we have arranged this awareness program so i'm uh, very happy to welcome our esteemed speaker dr seema alam professor and head of department of pediatric hepatology institute of uh, ilbs new delhi that is dealing with uh, hepatology and uh, transplant so i think it is a uh, dedicated transplant center which is uh, very uh, rare in india one of the rarest centers uh, doing uh, dedicated work in that area welcome madam to this meeting now the moderator is going to be uh, dr ajit krishnan the head, head of the department of pediatrics <clears throat> and uh, under him the academic activities have got streamlined from the half hazard manner in which it was being conducted before and uh, uh, thanks thank you uh, ajit uh, for uh, uh, linking with uh, iap in all your programs and welcome dr ajit and now i, I have to welcome uh, dr prashant uh, the one man army Uh, conducting the gastroenterology uh, unit so hopefully he'll get uh, helping hands soon and the instrument soon but anyway it's a very good beginning that we have started a unit in sat hospital and that's a, a good beginning and he has been uh, um, arranging so many uh, 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 programs cme programs on uh, gastroenterology topics which we are not familiar with and pfic is an uh, one which we have heard of and but have not treated many patients so actually whatever inf information that we are going to get is going to be um, of uh, great importance to us so uh, welcome dr prashant and also thank you for arranging this meeting and uh, dr praveen actually is uh, uh, our secretary actually secretary and president are rolled uh, into one he has been doing the job of both president and secretary thank you praveen for uh, the uh, work that you, you are doing and also for arranging this meeting and uh, we uh, iap tiruvannadapuram has got a youtube channel madam uh, seema madam uh, so uh, we all actually prefer to listen uh, at our convenience uh, so generally the the attendance in meeting will be something like uh, 30 but uh, the uh total uh, uh, people who will be listening to it after a few days will be a few hundreds so that is our uh, usual thing because that is easier now that the online platform has come it is easier that uh, they can uh, listen at their own convenience it, uh, all these programs uh, dr praveen will be uploading in our youtube channel now and uh, uh and uh, i see dr shankar lalitha madam and uh, who else welcome all uh, to this meeting and uh, i welcome all the uh, participants to the meet back to dr pravin uh, thank you sir for the kind words may i call upon our hod Pro professor ajit krishnan sir to introduce the speaker and the topic uh, thank you sandosh sir uh, 
respected uh, sandosh uh, sir our uh, uh, former hod and iap uh, president tiruvannadavaram uh, and uh, dr praveen uh, secretary iap tiruvannadavaram dr uh, prashant and our uh, guest our speaker professor dr seema alam and then my uh, other iap officials uh, my dear teachers colleagues fellow pediatricians and postgraduate students and first of all let me congratulate dr prashant and iap tiruvannadavaram for arranging this uh, lecture, lecture about pfic and dr prashant actually he has to be acknowledged because he will use each and every opportunities to teach us about the uh, rare and important problems in gastroenterology problems as sandosh sir rightly said and today's talk is on pfic a primer for the pediatrician actually as sir said the pfic, PFIC is a, a, a group of uh, genetic disorders rare group of genetic disorders that is uh, not very familiar with the pediatricians but they have to be uh, really uh, primed with those uh, rare diseases so that, because it is it will lead on to end stage uh, liver disease then regarding the speaker about the speaker professor dr seema alam uh, established the first ever department of pediatric hepatology in the country at the institute of liver and biliary sciences new delhi the department has achieved various milestones starting the pediatric liver transplantation program september 2011 initiation of post doctoral certificate course in pediatric hepatology in january 2013 and dm program in pediatric hepatology from september 2013 nationally the first ever and only training in the super specialty she is keenly interested in metabolic liver disease and her earnest enthusiasm has helped create widespread awareness about such disorders among pediatricians and adult gastroenterologists presently she is the professor and head department of pediatric hepatology and controller of examination in ilbs new delhi she was awarded with meta mithal shankar narayanan oration award isbag and mumbai 2018 and also icmr international fellowship award and she is national joint coordinator iap supported by unicef she is a member of iap task force on diarrhea and malnutrition since 2006 and national faculty in the childhood survival program of iap and unicef madam we have great pleasure in inviting you to speak on the subject over to madam thank you very much dr uh, ajit krishnan dr santosh kumar and of course uh, prashant the one man army and dr praveen who's uh, i must thank the uh, iip thiruvananthapuram to have uh, you know made this uh, possibility for me to come forward and uh, talk to you about this uh, topic is it me who's supposed to talk or is there somebody else who's to talk before me no madam madam you are the lone speaker so can i can i now share my screen yes madam yes madam okay has uh, everybody has to take off their screens before i can excuse me I think there's some problems. Uh, Prashant, will ha either you have to stop screen. Sh is, is somebody sharing the screen no, apart from me? No, no one is no. sharing. So sh I, I'm just clicking on share screen, but it doesn't seem to be okay. Let me just see entire screen. Madam, your PPT is open or not? It should be open. Then only you can share. Okay, but I thought it, I have to click on my PPT. Hello. Can you now see it? No. It 
it's open but i can't seem to be able to share it can you hear me yes madam so i'm not able to share it because it is not giving me the option of share praveen uh, in the middle of the screen can you see that uh, share screen uh, yellow Uh, sorry green i can see that share screen i can see see that share screen but the, there is a button below when i when i click on that share screen there is a window which opens and it has two buttons cancel and share it is not allowing me to click on share okay now it is allowed okay, oh, okay. can you see the can you see the yes yes yes, yes 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 it has gone yes ma'am yes so so we go forward from here quickly Praveen wanted me to talk about. Praveen wanted me to talk about my department a little. Uh, two three slides on that. So everybody, this is the Department of Pediatric Hepatology, and like everybody said, we started in December two thousand ten, and now that uh, we are almost eleven uh, years from that time, we are uh, we having three. Uh, you know students who are joining us every year from the neat program for dm pediatric hepatology initially we started to doing the uh, pdcc but now we are not doing pdcc anymore we are only the input that we are having is only of the dm students of dm students pediatric hepatology through the neat so this is what our department's uh, advantages are that we run along with the adult hepatology unit the adult hepatology units it improves our understanding of viral hepatitis very cell bleed hepatic encephalopathy integrities of sbp ascites hepatopulmonary syndrome similarly we teach them a lot about genetics and the congenital structural disorders and regeneration we taught, tell them about how to uh, use the genetic tools based on that we have so, some international collaborations and research grants that are going on right now with us and hence we are doing a lot of genetic diseases uh, right now so this is this is how we 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 kind of have a sim symbiotic relationship with the adult hepatology they teach us and we te we we also kind of uh, teach them in the re in return so and this is the number of students who have been kind of uh, you know Uh, been trained by us the pdcc students have almost been 14 pdcc students that we we have trained but now of late we have stopped taking in taking of the pdc students we feel that uh, uh, this pediatric hepatology needs at least 3 years of training to be really sound in your knowledge and understanding so we are only having dm students and six dm students have completed their course another six are right now enrolled with us so from here onwards i will tell you i will talk about pt about pfic or progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis from now onwards uh, the the progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis i'll refer to it as pfic madam, i hope uh, madam yes i think yes. Slides, slides are not moving madam what is not moving slides are not moving actually slides full screen now now i think uh, not moving you can't you can't see uh, it is it is moving madam please uh, uh, keep it in i'll do this screen. screen again full screen madam full screen, screen mode full screen mode full screen okay just a second can somebody tell me how to do the full screen mode it is actually there in that uh, 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 Tool bar lower down, madam. That there is an option at the extreme uh, right. Full screen, yeah. Full screen. We have to so, just click on that. It is not. It is not allowing me to click on that. I'm just, trying. Just beneath the uh, slides, actually, there will be a red bar, and uh, below the uh, under the extreme. Where, where do you think? Where, where the slides? Just below the slide, there will be a toolbar, madam. That will be coming. On that, there will be an option for full screen view. No, but I can't. I can't see the slides at all. Madam, yeah, you can. Um, can you see that slide show menu bar and top? Yes, oh. I can, but it's not allowing me to click on that. can uh, try once again ma'am 
should I share the screen all over again? Can okay. somebody stop my sharing screen and then I share it again? Okay. I don't know what's gone wrong. Is it now? Yeah, now it's useful, man. Yeah, from the it's top cool. menu, uh, please click on that slideshow. Can you can you now see? Yes, madam, but that uh, full screen has not come actually. The slide sorter view is still there. Oh, I can. I have removed the slide uh, slaughter. In my oh. this thing, there is no slide slaughter, but I don't know what to do. Okay. Prashant, how are you seeing it? Uh, yeah, we are, we are seeing with the uh, slide sorter view also, madam. It, it has not become full screen. So, what do I do? Tell me. Maybe, I, uh, I, I, stop again. I think, I think uh, madam can proceed with this. Yeah, yeah this, uh, okay. easily visible. So, PFIC is progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis. If you all can see it. Yes, and uh, I just share with you a small uh, case of a girl who was 2.5 years, started to have jaundice from three months onwards. And, you know, she was also having not only jaundice, she was also having, um, you know, um, to start with jaundice at three months of age with failure to thrive. And slowly by six months or so, she started having itching as well. Now, this is the typical kind of a presentation that starts within the first year or within six months that you see in PFICs. And these are the children that you have to pick up. So they have jaundice, they have itching all over the body, and they usually have failure to thrive. And associated with this, they would have hepatosplenomegaly, they would have even, uh, you know, fail, liver failure to begin with later on. So this is how the child came up. She came up with severe pruritus, rickets, hepatosplenomegaly, severe growth failure. And, I, and finally, after liver biopsy, we thought of this to be a progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis. And later on, through the genetics, it turned out to be cholestasis type 1, PFIC type 1. So this is the usual presentation that you have. And the pediatrics uh, you know, residents here should remember this kind of a presentation because this is what you're going to see most of the times. Now, just let's just give a few minutes to this one diagram and try to understand as to what really happens. I'll try to simplify this diagram as much as possible. See, first of all, don't see this part of the this thing. Just see this part first. So this is a hepatocyte. Right, In the hepatocytes, there are certain... Madam, Madam you have not changed. changed the slide, ma'am. Slide has not been changed. But for me, it has changed. What do I do? Oh. So what do you think is happening? I have, I don't know really what Sam, to do. Ma'am, uh, can you use the down arrow for uh, moving the slides in the keyboard? Can you, can you, now, now has it come for you? No. Is, this is a diagram that you can see? No, from no, alternate no, no. Uh, no, madam, only that introduction slide is uh, shown. Oh, the, uh, you can only see the slide where there is a, where, where there's a child's, uh, this thing. No, 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 madam. Only that introduction slide, PFIC introduction and new learning. Only that slide is visible. Oh my God, it is it's so God. It is not moving at all. So what do I do? Tell me. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the left side, that uh, sorter uh, view, can you click and see whether it is moving down? down. I don't know what is happening. <clears throat> Madam, another option is uh, sending it to Prashant. Uh, so that he Prashant, can... I'll, I'll just send it to you immediately. So if you can send it by mail to Prashant, Prashant will share I it. I can do you. that. I can do that immediately. Okay, ma'am. Okay, Thank okay, you. Okay. Prashant, okay. I'm sending it to you. Okay, done, Prashant. I'm, it's gone. We are downloading it, madam. One minute. Sure. 
Should I stop sharing now? Try and stop sharing. Yes, madam. Please stop share. Okay. And how do I stop sharing? Oh, no, it's already stopped, ma'am. It's already stopped. Okay, done. It, uh, the mail has not come, it seems. Oh, PPT, PPT. Ma ma actually, the attachment is not there, madam. Att attachment is not there. Att the mail has come, but the attachment is not there. Oh my god, I can see the attachment here, but it seems to be not going to you. No. Prashant, tell me your ID. Yeah, yeah yes, ma'am. Now it now, has come. It has now come. Now it has come, ma'am. It has come. Okay, okay. Praveen, please allow Prashant to share. Yeah, everyone can share. Is this screen visible now? Yes, yes, yes. I can see that, yeah. So, uh, madam, when, when you say next, Prashant will change the slides. No, Prashant, but I can't see it as an entire screen. screen. Right. Show me as an entire screen. Okay. It's in the slides sort of full screen. View. Yeah, full screen. Show it in the full screen to me. Yeah. Inter full screen. It's written inter full screen. Go above, go above. On the top, it is written inter full screen. Oh, one minute. Yes, ma'am. No, it's not in full screen. Yes, madam. It has now become full screen. Sandar, sir, can you see it in ah, full screen? Yes, it is seen uh, in full screen, madam. It is okay. Full Okay. Uh, actually, to me, it is not full screen, but I, I think I'll manage. But doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I think I'll manage. Okay. So, yes. Uh, go to the next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yes. So, this is what I was showing you, that this is... Okay. So, just wait here, Prashant. Okay. So, the, this, this is a... Just give me one minute. I want to make it full screen for myself. Yeah. So this is the, Prashant, it's not, I cannot see it properly. That's my problem. I, I can't see it. And if I don't, how do I, how do I tell you, how do I talk? Here it if is I full screen. It. Here it is full screen, madam. Here, here it is full screen only. Okay, uh, I can't see it. I don't know what is going wrong with Praveen, this. Uh, what could be the reason, Praveen? How can we help? Praveen, ma'am, uh, you can uh, open your own PowerPoint and uh, uh, talk with that. Prashant will uh, change the slides accordingly. Okay, Prashant, okay, Prashant just stay here and I'll, I'll speak on this. I can see okay. it now clearly. Okay, so just remember that uh, you, can't see my, you can't see my pointer anymore. So I'll have to work without the pointer, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so then I'm what I'm telling you is the that part of this this diagram where the liver is in, in the top. If you see that diagram, basically, uh, Prashant, just keep keep your uh, this thing here. Basically, in the hepatocyte where it is written hepatocyte, there you have these uh, uh, you know some some uh, receptors like. FXR, this is very important. And this FXR is a hepatocyte FXR as well as a enterocyte FXR. Now, FXR has a very important role to play in hepatocyte. Mm -hmm. It regulates the amount of, uh, you know, the amount of bile acid production as well as the bile acid transport outside the hepatocyte. So FXR is, and what are the transporters which help in the, in in, in bringing the bile out, outside into the canaliculi? 
these are two transport of genes that are present there abc b4 and abc b11 so just just to show you that these are the various important uh, you know receptors as well as the genes which are responsible now if you see these genes are present in the nucleus in the second part of this same diagram uh prashant can you can you label, can you just put your cursor here in the second part of the diagram these genes are present in the in the nucleus and they are also present over the canalicular membrane they they actually affect these transporters on the canalicular membrane if you see there are three canalicular membranes here one is the uh, fic1 bsep that is bile acid, bile salt exporter pump and the third one is mdr3 that is multi drug so these transporters are responsible for for shifting the for making the bile have uh, you know uh, producing the bile and sending it outside the outside the liver into the canaliculi go to the next slide um, prashant next slide i can't see the next slide Prashant, next slide. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. So then, next slide. Okay, okay, Prashant. So stay here. Stay put here. So these are the. the this is the canaliculi. If you see, this is the one line that you see is the can canaliculi, and they they these are the this through this canaliculi goes out the cholesterol. the phosphatidyl col chloroquine the bile salt and the amino and all them they all all of these put together once they go out especially the cholesterol phosphatidyl choline and the bile salt they coalesce together to become the micelles if you remember micelles and in the form of a micelle they travel in the bile so it's the it's the abc b4 and abc b11 along with the cholesterol outward together which are responsible for making the bile and once this has happened the amino phospholipid will be coming into the hepatocyte through the same canalicular membrane and actually it will help in the balancing out the integrity of the canalicular membrane so this particular part of the com complete uh, uh you know bile transport is very important for us to understand before we go ahead and talk about the the pfics now let's go let's go to the next slide so when we talk of various types of pfic the important two P various the important two ones the first two ones that were first for the first time uh, recognized for pfic1 and 2 the commonest one among them is the pfic2 but yes pfic1 and pfic2 the, the, there is not much difference between the two i don't want you to remember the details of we know that protein that is responsible for pfic2 is bsep and this is the most commonest uh, uh, disorder to happen the, there is no protein that we know as of now of pfic1 but the gene is available that is atp8b1 and here in pfic2 the gene is abcb11 we will just discuss this we'll just talk about this and nothing else so this this is the pfic2 go go to the next slide prashant i can't see the next slide but you must be trying प्रशांत ओन डे क्लिक की हाँ यस ओके नो प्रशांत आई थिंक देस वन मोर स्लाइड बिफोर दिस ओके ओके जस्ट लेट लेट इट बी प्रशांत लेट इट बी जस्ट स्टे स्टे पुट लाइक दिस सो इफ यू दिस दिस इज वन पेपर वन ऑफ द फ्यू earliest papers which showed how to differentiate between pfic1 and bsep bsep is pfic2 so like you have seen pfic1 is the first column the only thing that seems to be different between the two groups if you look at their birth weight their birth weight seems to be the same their age of onset of the disease seems to be about 2 to 3 months their john the symptoms initially intermittent symptoms there that is also there in both the types the jaundice is also present in both the types the manifestation of vitamin deficiencies is also present in both the types so the only thing that was different between the two was the presence of diarrhea in pfic1 rather than in pfic2 
two, PFIC2 doesn't have diarrhea, but PFIC1 has diarrhea. So this is how they could initially clinically differentiate between the two, because they seem to be having almost a similar presentation. Prashant, go ahead. Now, another slide telling you what is the difference between them. What's, if, you, if you can just have a look, all the extra hepatic manifestations, whether it's diarrhea, if you see the diarrhea, the third, third row or fourth row, diarrhea, pancreatic disease, uh, rickets, pneumonia, hearing loss, all and, and failure to thrive, including height as well as weight. All this seems to be much more affected in PFIC1. The percentage, if you see, is much more for PFIC1 for all these things rather than for PFIC2. The one thing that is pre solely present in PFIC2 is gallstones, cholesterol gallstones. And that you see is almost present in 38 to uh, 30, 28 to 38%. So this is what they found different. The old, so, so it's PFIC1, which has a lot of extra hepatic manifestations, whereas in PFIC2, there was just one uh, uh, manif extra manifestation apart from the jaundice and the pruritus was the gallstone. So this is how this initially started differentiating between the two. Go ahead, go go to the next slide, please. So if you on on an uh, if uh, at a glance, if you want to understand as to what is the difference between PFIC one and PFIC two, so the age of presentation is usually a uh, little earlier for PFIC two rather than PFIC one, maybe few months earlier. End-stage liver disease is usually very late for PFIC1. So it, it starts late and it actually has an end-stage liver disease or cirrhosis happening usually in the second decade. Whereas in PFIC2, it's a very rapid progression. In the neonatal period to infancy, it will come. And within the first few years, it may even become end-stage liver disease and need a transplant. So course of the disease is moderately severe in PFIC1, where it is severe in PFIC2. The pruritus is also very severe in PFIC2, whereas it not, it's not that severe in PFIC1. They are still able to carry on with their life in, uh, without uh, needing treatment. But in PFIC2, usually they need treatment very early. Extrahepatic manifestation, I've already told you, are present only in PFIC1. The reason being that the PFIC1 protein is not only present in liver, but it's also present in the pneumocytes. It is present in the islet cells of pancreas. It is present in the ear. Uh, in the inner ear, it is present even in the ent enterocyte cytoskeleton. So all this, because of all this, there are extra hepatic manifestations in PFIC1. Whereas in PFIC2, there are no extra hepatic manifestations. There are only gallstones. The risk of liver tumor, one such tumor is hepatocellular carcinoma. This risk of hepatocellular carcinoma has been seen to be much more in PFIC2, which is very high because the bile salt causes the uh, tumorogenic or the carcin it becomes carcinogenic because it is so much of bile salts which is getting uh, you know uh, collected or accumulated in the liver that finally it may lead to even uh, hepatocellular carcinomas in these children in PFIC2. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, now if you try to look at the investigations. The most important investigation that you should look at is the gamma GT. Mostly in most hospitals, gamma GT does not is not present in the set of liver function tests that we usually do. But I think for every every hospital who's wanting to work in, in liver or wanting to see these patients, it's very important to do the gamma GT. You can get it done from somewhere or you can get get this done in the hospital itself. The gamma GT of both these patients of both the sets of patients will be low. Any, anything below 50, anything below 30 or 50. So that is usually the normal gamma GT and it will be low in these patients. The transaminases may be high, higher. AST, ALT, or SGOT, SGPT will be higher in type 2, that is BCEP. Uh, the bilirubin and uh, the jaundice, hemoglobin, all this is going to be the same. Very important here is to remember that cholesterol is going to be low in both the groups. Bile acids, serum bile acids, some of the hospitals do serum bile acids, my hospital does it, will be raised in both. So normal serum bile acids is about 10, but it's raised in both types 1 and type 2, but it's much more raised in type 2, and that is the reason for hepatocellular carcinomas to happen early in type 2. BSEP. Go ahead, please. So uh, up till now, what? Yes, uh, we can discuss. We will we will revise this later. But just just a little bit about the histology. In PFIC1, when you do a liver biopsy, you find nothing but but 
just bland cholestasis. Lot lot of bile plugs present in the liver between the hepatocytes, inside the hepatocytes, in the canalicular, uh, you know, on the canal canalicular membrane. You will find a lot of bile uh, bile present. So that is the only thing that you will find. But in PFIC2, the, in the earlier PF, earlier patient or the younger patient with PFIC2 will have more of, um, you know, more of uh, giant cell transformation because there's a lot of bile salt there, which is causing inflammation. And for neonatal or infant liver to show to when it whenever it gets inflamed, it becomes it shows giant cell transformation. So there will be a lot of giant cell transformation and slowly the fibrosis will set in. It will become portal fibrosis. And so hepatocellular necrosis and giant cell transformation is what you find initially and which it's much more there in these patients. Next slide, please. So this is a normal liver. On one side, you have the normal liver with normal immunostaining of the BCEP protein in the liver. So we have a stain, BCEP stain available, which can be put onto the normal liver. And you can see this normal staining on the canalicular because BCEP is largely is, is the transporter largely present on the canalicular membrane. And you can see it here. But in this PFIC2 patient's liver slide, if you see here, you don't see the same amount of BCEP here. There could be some amount of BCEP here and there, but definitely the, the normal le levels of BCEP is not here in this. And this could be, this, th this is one indication to say that this could be PFIC2 or BCEP deficiency present in this child. Next slide, please. Like I was telling you that initially in BCEP, in the infancy in the BCEP2 or PFIC2, you may have only giant cell transformation. You may have only, uh, you know, cholestasis. But as the child grows and becomes more than one year of age, cirrhosis sets in because this is a very progressive disease. So cirrhosis sets in. Even some of them even get HCC. So this is how. But as far as PFIC1 is concerned, even in less than one year or in uh, more than one year, you only find largely cholestasis happening, not much of cirrhosis or fibrosis present, and hardly any, will, any child will ever have STC or hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is how it is. So one disease, PFIC2, is a very progressive disease, whereas PFIC1 is a slowly progressive disease. Next slide, please. And that you can see even in the histology. Like I was telling you, the hepatocellular carcinomas have been commonly seen now in patients of uh, PFIC2, and that is because of the intrahepatic cholestasis leading to hepatocyte exposure to bile acids and inflammation, which promotes the cancer through the genomic modifications. Next slide, please. Now this is an, now now that we have talked about PFIC1 and PFIC2, we go ahead and call it. We now go ahead to the third type of low GGT cholestasis. So we know that both PFIC1 and PFIC2, that is FIC1 and BCEP, were both low GGT cholestasis. There's a third low GGT cholestasis, which has now been, been also pro, uh, being promoted and called as PFIC type 3, but largely it is called tight junction protein mutations, protein 2 mutations. We'll ju I'll just tell you it is what, what a tight junction uh, protein mutation, what is a tight junction protein 2, but this is, we saw that in a group of patients, neither was PFIC1 present or nor was PFIC2 present. Both these uh, genes was found to be normal. And in one third of these patients were still having low DGT cholestasis. These, such families were then looked for and they did a complete genomic uh, uh, analysis. And they found that, that there was a mutation of the TGP2 gene present in these patients, at least 12 of these 33 families, and all had very severe liver, liver disease. Some had some extra hepatic manifestations as well. Let's just understand what is TGP2 junction protein or tight junction protein 2. So these are the tight junction proteins. If you see here, there's Claudin and there is tight junction proteins. If there is a mutation of these tight uh, junction proteins, there will be some breakage and some, uh, some leakage of the bile from one side to the other. And that is what causes these uh, the cholestasis to happen. So this is tight, tight junction protein and this and see, it's there on the canalicular membrane. The PFIC1 is also there on the canalicular membrane. The BCEP is also there on the canalicular membrane. The MDR3, which we'll discuss later, is also there on the canalicular membrane. And TGP2 is also there on the canalicular membrane. They're all causing problems of bile flow 
outside the liver and hence resulting in cholestasis. Now, if you see here, this is just some histopathology reports. So this, these are the controls where you can see both. This is, the, this is what you see as PGP2 staining and here you can see Claudin staining. In case, in case one and two, both TGP2 as well as Claudin was found to be not staining properly. And there, hence it was thought that possibly they have TGP2, that complete junction protein absence present, or maybe there is abnormality of this protein and it is not getting stained. Next slide. Now, so after TGP2, we need to go back again and just a glimpse into the FXR again so that I can discuss with you the, the next type of the PFIC. The next type of the PFIC is really is, is, uh, is, the, is the mutation of the FXR. I told you there's an FXR in the liver and there's an FXR in the enterocyte. And both these effects are basically responsible for regulating the bile salt movement or the bile acid movement and not allowing the accumulation of bile, bile acids. So whether it is the, 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 when the amount of movement through BCEP and through ABC4 is also done by FXR. And once it comes to the intestine, the recirculation or the reabsorption of the bile acid through ASBT is also with the help of the, the enterocyte FXR. So FXR plays a very important role in bile flow. And the next slide, please. So they, they, they found a set of patients who seem to be presenting very early in life. Up till now, I told you they usually present by three to four months or six months. But this set of patients were presenting by birth, by two weeks, some of them by six weeks. And not only that, they seem to be going downhill very fast. Uh, again, they were presenting with jaundice and uh, severe failure to thrive because they were so small that they were not even showing itching. Pruritus comes by three to six months. The receptors for pruritus or itching is not there in, in younger babies. So if we don't see itching in these babies. And what else we saw was, again, they all had low GGT. Like the uh, other three, the three that I've explained before, they all had low GGT. They had, uh, the, the INR was very high. So they were actually having coagulopathy present or they were having liver failure going, was going on in these patients. So, and one more thing is very important is that the, the, the um, alpha fetoprotein was also high in these patients. So if you, if you have a patient who's coming early, who's showing jaundice, who's having a very high alpha fetoprotein, who's having low GGT, and who's also having the INR to be raised, then it should ring a bell in your mind that this could be PFIC type 4, or what is also known as the FXR mutation. Go, go to the next slide, please. So as you see in these four patients, then once they started doing the staining of these four patients, not only were the FXR not staining, but even the MDR3 and BCF was not staining. And you've understood why it is not staining, because FXR is responsible for the BCF and the MDR3 expression in the liver. So once the, the FXR patients are, will not only have not, not the FXR staining not present, but even the BCEP and the MDR3 is going to be deficient in these patients. Hence, it's, it, it, it raises a very important question. We can talk about it in the question and session. Next slide. Which is the gene for FXR? This is the gene, NRIH4. So this is the gene, the one allele and the other allele, and in both, almost all the four patients had mutations present in these, uh, in these, uh, allele, uh, you know, in this gene, and there was severe neonatal cholestasis with coagulopathy, with vitamin K independent coagulopathy, and these were the patients who had actually FXR deficient low GGT PFIC. So this is the fourth type of PFIC that you get to see again low GGT. Go ahead, next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, about this, uh, this just, just click again so once more. Once more. Yeah. Okay, just leave it like this. So this is the, these are five patients who seem to be again having normal serum GGT levels. They may not be low, but nor normal serum GGT levels with jaundice, with pruritus, with hepatomegaly present, but presenting a little late, that is in the second year of life, mostly by 14, 12, 7, 10, and you know, around about 12 to 14 months of life. So this is this is a little 
uh, you know, late presentation of PFRC type 5, which is also known as myo 5B deficient. So th these are usually later, they present later, they are a little milder, they may have recurrence of symptoms again and again. And, and uh, you know, so recurrence is very common in these patients. Go, go to the next slide, please. So in all these five patients, what was seen? Again, the GGT was very low on low or normal or it's largely normal low. The bile salts were very high in the in the in the serum. Uh, there were the age of presentation was naturally not as young as I, I have been discussing up till now. These are late presenters, and they they have normal INR, they have normal um, alpha fetoprotein. So everything else is sim similar. And even total cholesterol is not that low. So everything else is similar. The only thing that is very important here is the age of presentation. And again, they are low GGT. The bile salts are high. Go ahead. Next slide, please. So this is about all the low GGT PFICs. There's only one PFIC which has high GGT, and that is PFIC type 3. So up till, okay, sorry, I called the uh, TJP2 as type three, that TJP2 is type four, uh, the FXR is type five, and uh, the um, last one that is Myo5B is actually type, um, th that is type six. So the, the first ones to come uh, and, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the literature were one and two, and then people recognize the ABCB4 molecule. This is a gene which controls the PFIC type three. There's a difference in this PFIC. The most common presentation in childhood that you get to see, that we get to see, we have transplanted a lot of these, four or five of these patients now. Uh, these are PFIC type three, where MDR3 is the, is the protein, and the gene is ABCB4 they usually come to you with recurrent episodes of jaundice as well as pruritus, but milder jaundice, milder pruritus. What is the most common presentation amongst them is that by 10 to 11 or 12 years of age, they will come to you with cirrhosis and portal hypertension. So they will come to you once they start needing a liver transplant, which is in another two to three years of time, they would, they would need a liver transplant. This is the commonest presentation. Apart from this, ABC B4 seems to be also happening you know, not in childhood, but even even in the adulthood, it may come in patients with gallstones. It may be it may only cause gallstones. It may cause um, drug induced uh, cholestasis. Like in girls, it may uh, females. It may cause the cholestasis due to uh, oral contraceptives. It may cause even intrahepatic, uh, you know, cholestasis of pregnancy. So this this one ABCB4 it seems to be not only happening in pediatrics, but also is there even in the adulthood. Next slide, please. So these are children who have, there is about, this is on the, um, the PFIC. Now let's just go back and quickly look at PFIC 1, 2, and 3. 18 chromosome, chromosome PFIC1, 50 known mutations, second chromosome PFIC2, that is BSEP, and 200 known mutations, seventh chromosome PFIC3, that is ABCB4, and 300 known mutations. I've just talked to you, these are early onset, mostly, most severe one is this one, PFIC2. The PFIC1 is less severe one. The PFIC1 and 2 are early onset, whereas the PFIC3 is late onset. They usually come with delayed puberty, with hepatosplenomegaly, with cirrhosis, with portal hypertension, whereas the other two will present to you like I've already told you. The GGT is the only difference between all of them. All of them will have both the first two will have low GGT to normal, whereas PFIC3 will have high GGT. Uh, AFP is going to be high only in PFIC2 sometimes, but in other two, AFP is going to be normal. AST, ALT is largely only raised usually in PFIC2. GGT, like I told you, and the, tot and the C bile acids is high in almost all of them. It's uh, highest in the PFIC2. Next slide. So how do you look for immunostaining of um, PFIC3? This is the normal MDR stain that you use here, and it seems to be absent in the PFIC3 liver. What do you find in histopathology of PFIC? Like I told you, they usually come to you with, with the cirrhosis. So they usually have ductular proliferation and extensive portal fibrosis and biliary cirrhosis already happening in the patient once they come to you. 
So this is how you see the MDR3 usually come very late in 10 years to 12 years to 13 years of age. Next slide, please. So large cohort, this was possibly done in somewhere in Europe where they looked all the three, pro, the, the three genes that I talked talk to you about, FIC1, FIC2, and FIC3, that is BCEP, MDR3, and FIC1, and they found BCEP, FIC1, and MDR3, and they found, next slide, please, that one third, 35% of the total cohort of 149 children had at least one mutation of one of these genes. So it is very much present around us. And 82% of these patients were under 18 years of age. So they're largely being handled by you and me. FIC1 is, was present in 22%, BCEP was present in 10%, and MDR3 was present in 30% in the adulthood. So adulthood means the most common presentation is of MDR3, that is PFIC3. MDR3 are largely mutations first present in adulthood with low phospholipid associated uh, cholestasis and biliary cirrhosis. And in women, they usually see, uh, you know, OCs, uh, you know, cholestasis associated with OCs or even ICP, that is intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Next slide, please. So how do we treat these patients? Very simple, arsodeoxycholic acid and rifampicin, naltrexone, this may, comes one by one in an approach, stepwise approach for the treatment of pruritus. So this is the first line, second line, and third line management of pruritus, along with nutritional supplementation, fat-soluble vitamins, and of course, MCT oil also to improve the nutrition of these patients. Sometimes they, it is not possible to treat with this and the child is having very severe pruritus. Sometimes we use plasma pharesis here, but largely you once you don't find much improvement in the patient with the medical management through arsodeoxy, rifampicin, and naltrexone, then we do the liver biopsy and assess the fibrosis of this child. If the child has already gone for cirrhosis, he needs a liver transplant. But if the child is not cirrhotic, just some amount of fibrosis is there, then there are some biliary diversion surgeries that can be done to help out these patients. And what are these biliary diversion surgeries? First, just a word about arsodeoxycholic and rifampicin. Next slide, please. So arsodeoxycholic acid, next slide. No, no, just inter again. So it stimulates the hepatocellular secretion of hydrophobic bile acid by complex post transcriptional signaling. Next slide. It also stabilizes the biliary carbonate umbrella, it's protecting the cholangiocytes and periportal hepatocytes against the hydrophobic bile acids. Next slide. It reduces the bile toxicity by increasing the hydrophilicity, you know, water mission. Next slide. Okay, so next slide. Yeah, next slide. So we give Utka, but it helps in some of these patients, not all patients. So is rifampicin. Rifampicin stimulates the expression of the pregnant X receptor sensitive genes, which can be either this enzyme, which is cytochrome 450, which is responsible for hydroxylation of the bile salts. It can also be with, through this UDP glucuronyl transferase, which is responsible for the glucuronyl radiation of the bilirubin. So it is also causing helping out in every which way to remove the bile. It is also upregulates the SHP, which is the which acts through FXR to decrease the um, uh, to increase the amount of uh, flow of the bile flow. It also reduces the uh, uh, synthesis of bile salts. So every which way, rifampicin helps both by excretion also by the synthesis of uh, the the um, uh, bile salts here as well as of the synthesis of the cholesterol through which the bile salts are synthesized so every which way it is helping out so this is how rifampicin helps out in these patients next slide please now i was talking of of the biliary diversion surgeries which may help out if the medical treatment medical management has not helped out so these are the three types of surgeries that people do Partial external biliary diversion. We'll just explain to you in the next slide. If you can go to the next slide, I can explain to you through the diagram. Okay, so these are this is the PEBD, that is partial external biliary diversion. You have made a condo between the uh, the gallbladder and the outside of the body. So directly, this is getting uh, floating floating out. 
Whereas PIBD is another thing that I will tell you. This is what we are doing most of the times that the gallbladder through a ruin Y is directly connected to the colon so that this goes to the colon and goes out and you don't have too much of reabsorption of the bile and hence there is less amount of bile in the body. The third way is that they also make a ruin Y where they completely bypass the um, in, uh, intestines and so they, they also seem to be helping out and um, they, this also causes the same amount of this thing. So in a way, all these things are required, these ability diversion surgeries, which are actually going to remove the bile from the recirculation. And that is how they help. Next slide, please. But do they help in all types of PFICs? If you see here in PFICs, if you take all the PFICs in one go, pre-op, this was the severity of the pruritus present. Whereas one year and two years later, the severity of pruritus had come down. So 50% had no pruritus, while 21% had pruritus at the end of two years after the PEBD done for this for the pruritus. This is what was seen in PFIC. And this, this you know, encouraged the people to go ahead and do these surgeries more often. Next slide, please. Prashant, next slide. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, yeah. So if you see here, within these PFICs, if you see FIC1 and BCEP, it seems to be helping out the FIC1 better. So see, pre-op, before the surgery, so many had severe pruritus. Whereas after the surgery, the number of patients with pruritus decreased dramatically. Whereas in BCEP, the number of patients did not decrease that dramatically. Or maybe if you consider everything in total, then they don't help out so much in BCEP. Actually, they help out in some of the mutations and not in all mutations. Whereas in FIC1, they're likely to help out in almost all mutations. So PBDs are helping out in PFIC more so in FIC1 than in BCEP. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is if you have a two-month-old, you do a PBD with this mutation, he improved and no LT was needed. You have a you have an 18 month old with pruritus. He was also a BCEP with another nonsense mutation. This was a missense mutation. Here it was a nonsense mutation and one missense also. He we did a PEBD here and not improved and he needed a LT. So this is how you can see the difference in the various bile salt export pump deficiency PFICs. You find them to be behaving differently from the FIC1 um, you know, type of deficiency. Next slide, please. As far as the, both the surgeries are concerned, that is PEBD versus transplant, you do the medical therapy, 10% are helped out, but both these surgical methods together, there's 80% success rate of this. If there is no cirrhosis, go for PEBD. And if the PEBD does not help out, then go for OLT. Or if there is already cirrhosis present in the patient, then don't do PEBD. Straight away, go for the liver transplant. This is what we should be doing. Next slide, please. Liver transplantation indicated in those with intractable pruritus and or failure of all other therapies. If there is cirrhosis present, if there is hepatocellular carcinoma present, the issues are with FIC1. FIC1 don't do very well with a liver transplant. And you would understand why, because it's a multi-systemic involvement. You have so much of extra hepatic manifestations that all those extra hepatic manifestations carry on having problems even after liver transplant. The only thing that you've replaced is the liver. So the rest of the manifestations, manifestations continue. Hence, the PFIC1 don't do very well. And also, sometimes the heterozygous donors may have problems. Next slide. Next slide, please. In PFIC2 also, after transplant, there is some problem. This, these are livers which have never had BCEP protein present in them. So once you change the BCEP liver, you get a new liver for the patient. Now there is BCEP protein present. He's never had BCEP protein, but now he has BCEP protein. So they develop antibodies or alloimmune antibodies against the new BCEP that they have found. And this tends to cause a lot of inflammation symptoms. Again, start resembling the pre-LT symptomatology. And usually they have disease can start from two months to 108 months after liver transplant. They again have low GGT, but high bile acids. And 
these are the various drugs which have um, rituximab, IVIG, plasmapheresis, and then of course, finally, retransplantation, what has been advised for these patients. It may occur in almost 8 to 17% of those PFIC2 who go for liver transplant. Next slide, please. And this only happens in BCEP, not in all others. So I, I summarize and conclude in this last slide, and that is there are six to seven types, or um, you, I would keep it six types, uh, known types of um, five known types of low GGT PFIC, and there is one type of high GGT PFIC, which is type three. Whereas the low GGT PFIC is one, the BCEP, that is PFIC two, then the TGP two that is PFIC4, then the FXR deficiency, that is a PFIC5, and then the Myo5B deficiency, that is PFIC6. Only one with high GGT is PFIC3, that is MDR deficiency, MDR3 deficiency. They present this chronic cholestatic liver disease right from the infancy to the older childhood. Uh, just let me finish that slide, um, Prashant. Leave this, Prashant. Just go to that... Uh, Go to that slide just before this. Just before the thanks slide, go above the thanks slide. Yes, yeah, just let me complete this. I don't go to the slides after thank you slide. So mutational analysis is a must for efficient management of these patients. Management is aimed at relieving pruritus, nutritional rehabilitation, and improving the quality of life, which then this management is in the form of medical therapy first, like I told you, then the non-transplant surgeries, that is PEBD, the ileal uh, bypass surgeries, and the, uh, you know, the internal PEBD or PIBD, that is uh, in, in, you know, internal biliary diversion, and external biliary diversion. And then finally, if all this not, doesn't work, then liver transplantation is the final hope for these patients. Thank you. Yes, Prashant, I've completed. I hope I haven't taken more time than what was allotted to me. One minute. <laughs> Is Prashant taking over? Do, do you want me to say something? Dr. Ajit, can you take over? It's a moderation. Or shall I? Ajit, you are not audible. Ajit, you are not audible. Okay, uh, shall I take over? Ajit uh, sir, please unmute. Uh, okay. Sir, I, I couldn't uh, near the unmute. Yeah, but yeah. Okay. 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 Thank, uh, thank you, madam, for the excellent talk. We have gone into the all the details of the. PFIC, a, a very, uh, even though it, it was uh, previously rare, with the uh, present coming into the picture, we have more and more PFIC diagnosed in our hospital, and we were able to do something about uh, those patients. So uh, I, 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 in, uh, present can take uh, take over and uh, uh, there, deal with the questions. There are a few questions in the chat box, madam. Uh, that is the normal cutoff for uh, GGT in an infant. Okay. So um, as far as the GGT is concerned in infants, uh, anything, uh, you know, anything above 50 will be considered as abnormal. <coughs> but uh, uh, largely, most of these patients will have GGT below 50. And, um, you know, the range of GGT in uh, all, all the PFI, low GGT PFICs is between 10 to 30. Mostly we said see 10 to 30 or 10 to 40. So most of them will have a GGT below 50. And uh, Madam, add, adding to that, uh, GGT uh, in newborn period is uh, likely to be very high. So when does it uh, come down and what is the cutoff in? Uh, no, 
infancy like that, that. That one uh, thing has not really been uh, proven, and I think GGT will will. And usually, if you ask me, uh, the low the the GGT is not going to be a be a, the neonatal GGT is not going to be affecting the uh, PFIC because most of them are happening after the neonatal period, except for FXR, where we we haven't seen too many FXR uh, deficiencies as of now. There are very few reported in the literature, but most of them do have low GGT that is less than fifty. So I uh, I will not be able to pinpoint as to what is the cutoff after neonatal period, but yes, neonatal uh, you know after neonatal period it is about 50, and most of the GG, most of the PFICs do not happen within the neonatal period. So that confusion doesn't happen. And Madam uh, GGT, I mean, what is the mechanism of why GGT is uh, elevated in uh, PFIC three? Yeah. So, see, what is happening is that, that in, GG, in PFIC3, the phospholipid is not going out. The phospholipid, which is actually a buffer in the, in the, uh, in the bile acids. And that buffer will then, if the, if the bile, so, bile uh, goes out without the phospholipid, so the buffer is missing. And when the buffer is missing, there will be cholangiocyte inflammation, and that causes the GGT to rise. The same thing does not happen for PFIC1 and 2, because in most of these, the phospholipid may not be that low. Thank you, ma'am. Present. Um, madam, is, is, is growth failure an indication for biliary diversion in PFIC type 2, even if cirrhosis is not there, and pruritus has been controlled with medications? No, I do not feel so. I think uh, the uh, diversion surgeries are largely, as of now, should be done only for uh, pruritus. And I think a, new, a strong and a very serious nutritional rehabilitation should be done for PFIC2 patients. Um, uh, and most of them do support uh, you know, nutritional rehabilitation. So it, it, it do 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 well after nutrition uh, rehabilitation. P the the diversion surgeries should be only for very severe pruritus, especially in PFIC two. Why? Because PFIC two do not do very well. Most of their uh, all the, all their mutations do not do very well with after the biliary diversion surgery. Only few of their mutations do well after biliary diversion surgery. The biliary diversion surgeries do very well in PFIC one, but they don't do so well in PFIC two. So to do it only for growth failure, I do not uh, recommend that. Not for only for growth failure, but yes, for uh, severe pruritus. If the cirrhosis has not happened, then you will go for it. Madam, is there any genotype genotype correlation between the mutations identified as far as PFIC is concerned? Say that again. Genotype phenotype correlation in PFIC. Yes, there is. I I have tried to uh, Prashant. I'm sure you're talking of those NAB studies that are available right now in Journal of Hepatology. I am uh, I'm the author in both those studies and. There is a BCEP type 1, 2, and 3 that they have tried to, uh, you know, they have tried to classify based on the type of mutations present. Similarly, in, in, uh, even in um, PFIC1, they have tried to classify based on the type of mutations present. And those seem to be behaving differently. And that is why I said for a good management, we must do the genetic management. I did not... Uh, you know, uh, very, very, um, uh, you know, intentionally, I did not include those studies here because I know you would have benefited by that, but I think I would have confused everybody else quite a bit. So th th those are works which are very recent. And uh, I think what is required is that there, these, the, there are two studies that you, the, these are coming from a consortium called NABD, N-A-P-P-E-D. Each, for each one of you, please go back and read them. They are present in the journal. In uh, One of them is present in the Journal of Hepatology, otherwise in Hepatology. I can send you both the stud studies. You please go through them. They have classified BCEP further. They have classified FIC1 further. And based on those classifications, they are now telling you as to which ones are uh, will go for liver transplant early, which ones will go for PEBD and then not need a transplant. So all that is now available. But... It's just the first studies that have that have come in both these type one and type three, type two. Madam, is there any age cutoff for biliary diversion surgeries? 
is there any age cut off no i don't think there is a age cut off i don't think there is a age cut off uh, i think the cut off is with cirrhosis it's the cirrhosis which is the most important factor which will tell you so every every diversion surgery should be preceded by a liver biopsy is liver biopsy must before we make a conclusive diagnosis or can we stop stop short by just doing the genetic study alone i don't feel that you should not do a liver biopsy because liver biopsy just not doesn't tell you only about uh, the um, the the changes which may suggest one of the uh, pfics they there are characteristic changes it is histopathological changes not only that it is also going to tell you as to what is the amount of fibrosis and cirrhosis already present in this child which may also give you inputs about the type of uh, and you may be able to do a targeted uh, gene also you don't have to do a complete whole genome uh, you know exome sequencing in that case you can go for targeted genes also or you can even understand the natural history of these patients better if you have a liver biopsy in your hand and one more question is there any relationship between pfic and nephrotic syndrome not that i know of not that i know of uh, recently I'm we had a, recently we had a case uh, that's why that question that was a referred case from calicut actually okay so you think it was a nephrotic syndrome who also developed who also had pfic no 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 i have seen no, association no, he had he had pfic initially subsequently he developed a nephrotic syndrome maybe with a drug or something uh, drug related nephrotic syndrome no 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 madam no no madam no okay not related to okay i haven't seen any such patient so i will not be able to tell you and there is no in in the literature there is no such association at least to the best of my knowledge there is no association present did you did you uh, do any re review of that no madam you could not find any definite association okay. and regarding the histopathological changes in pfic type 3 madam mentioned about bile duct proliferation etc but in all the cases we had what we were getting was like uh, bile duct paucity instead of the ductal proliferation yes in type 3 yes Then, uh, maybe and are, are you saying genetically proven type 3 or just uh, yes, yes, clinically uh, suspected genetically proven but uh, we instead of the uh, classical bile duct proliferation we were getting uh, uh, bile duct destruction in all these uh, all these cases mdr3 was absent see i i don't know if you remember but this was one question that i had put to schneider benjamin schneider in one of our uh, uh, meetings and at that time schneider completely refused to uh, accept that there will be any kind of bile duct uh, paucity present in any of these pfics but not in pfic3 but in, there's a new um, transporter that is called as abc c12 abc c it is known to cause bile duct paucity i do not know about pfic3 if they cause because most of our patients have not had bile duct paucity they've only had ductal proliferation and gone <coughs> further to have cirrhosis and have got transplanted because they come very late to you okay. they come around the end of the first decade okay madam if you are to give three important messages for the pediatricians regarding pfic that will be those three key messages so i think one message that i really want to again uh, re reinforce is that let's not forget biliatresia first so biliatresis uh, if a neonatal cholestasis syndrome patient comes to you that is a patient who has developed direct hyperbilirubinemia with after 14 days of life and he has come to you if he has a pale stool or even if he's just having fluctuating stool please first of all send that patient to the nearest pediatric gastroenterologist or hepatologist to ensure that biliatresia is ruled out do a liver biopsy immediately if you find the ggt to be high in that case then of course you are dealing with the biliatresia and that you will get to see in the ultrasound as well as in the in the liver biopsy but if the similar presentation a little later little later maybe few weeks later maybe a few weeks later but uh, uh, and comes to you then he may not be and with low ggt then he may not be biliatresia <clears throat> efic2 is the next important thing to keep in your mind and 
ask <clears throat> the pediatric gastroenterologist or hepatologist to work up that patient. These patients should be reaching the right facility in, in the right time, especially biliatresia and also PFICs to get the optimal management. Okay. Madam, uh, in, your, uh, uh, in your center, uh, doing transplant, what is the uh, uh, complication to the donor? I mean, how common is it and how bad None. is it? None. Okay. There have been 1,000, over 1,000 transplants, and to the best of my knowledge, there has been no mortality in donors. There may have been in some amount of morbidity. Now, that also I have not seen for a long time now. All my children, we've had uh, at least a pediatric transplant, at least, uh, I think we're doing 115 or 100, somewhere between 115 to 120. So all the donors, all these mm -hmm. transplants in children, not the, all the donors have gone back home within seven days. Within seven days. So as far as the donor is concerned, there is no need to worry. And as far as the recipient is concerned, there is 90% survival. And without transplant in most of those patients where you do transplant, there is 100% mortality. So you only gaining in the recipient. And regarding uh, PFIC2, um, you mentioned about re-transplant. Is it really of benefit uh, because the autoimmune mechanism is already... Uh, uh, destroyed yes. the first liver, so will uh, the second liver? Yeah, that that survive. that process, that problem with PFIC two remains. But do not forget that only happens in fifteen percent of the total transplant. The rest of them will live. We've had uh, PFIC two at least four or five such cases. We haven't as at, as of now we haven't uh, you know had any problem with PFIC two. Mm -hmm. Yes, but PFIC one, it's a nightmare to transplant them. I would rather not transplant them. PFIC one is a quite a, you know, quite a problem. I think if they, if PEBD doesn't work in PFIC one, then you should go for total biliary, uh, you know, diversion. There is something called as total biliary diversion where you make a own by and completely take it out. That should be done rather than um, liver transplant. I personally feel that liver transplants are not very well taken with the. PFIC. Maybe with time we will get a little more con uh, information about the various mutations PFIC1 which are not doing well and then on based on the mutations we can decide about the liver transplant even in PFIC1. Thank you ma'am. Thank you. Thank you madam for that uh, excellent lecture. Sir uh, can we conclude? Session? There are yes. No yes we can we can wind Thank up. Praveen has actually logged in for another meeting. But on behalf of Praveen, I would like to thank uh, all of us who have joined for this meeting. I would like to extend our uh, uh, gratitude to Seema Madam for having uh, given a wonderful lecture. Thanks to IAP Trivandrum, Sandosh Sir, and my HOD, Ajit Krishnan Sir, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you.